Uh, okay. Um, well, welcome everybody to this slightly later than usual um, quantum information seminar. Uh, today's speaker is, is Ed Barnes. Uh, Ed, he got his PhD from the University of California, San Diego, and he then went on to do a postdoc at the Condensed Matter uh, Theory Center and the Joint Quantum Institute at the University of Maryland. And in 2015, he, he joined Virginia Tech as a faculty member. And today he's, he's gonna talk to us about how to basically avoid and get rid of annoying errors in, in, in quantum computing, which I'm super excited about. So thanks a lot, Ed, for, for coming here and giving this talk um, and waking up fairly early, not too early. Uh, but yeah, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the, for the um, invitation to speak. So as David said, this is a talk about quantum control and how to drive qubit systems in particular in such a way that you reduce the effects of environmental noise. So I wanted to just mention a little bit about the, the theory group at Virginia Tech. So we have a large number of PhD students and postdocs now, and it's an ever-growing team working on various topics that I'll review in a second. So other than me, there are other faculty members, including Sophia Ekonom and Kuma Park from physics and also Nick Mayhoff from chemistry. And we're always looking for new people. So if you might be interested, don't hesitate to email me. So here's a kind of a quick overview of the topics that we work on at Virginia Tech. So we cover most types of, um, of solid state qubit platforms, like how to, how to think about the theoretical side of things, the physics and how to connect the physics of these devices to interesting applications like quantum algorithms and, and so on. And we also do some work on condensed matter theory of 2D materials and topological materials. We work on time crystals, many body localization, which is kind of connected between uh, quantum information and solid state physics. We also do a bit of work with quantum communication and measurement-based quantum computing. Um, and also recently we've done a lot of work in quantum algorithms uh, particularly for NISC type devices. And of course, I also we also do a lot of work on quantum control, which is the topic of today's talk. So this, this area is important for pretty much all quantum technologies from quantum computing, communications to simulation and sensing. Being able to control a quantum bit is critical for all these applications. And so we can have all of these in mind uh, throughout the course of today's talk. So just to, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the current status of quantum computing, but just to kind of give a, a quick summary of where some of the big companies are now, IBM, Google have devices consisting of superconducting qubits uh, up to 50 or, or more superconducting qubits on a chip. And IonQ has devices with 50 up to 100 now, I think the most recent system uh, of trapped ion systems. And one of the major challenges, especially for the solid state devices, is how to control these qubits in such a way that you can suppress the effects of the environment while at the same time doing operations. So interactions with the environment cause noise and decoherence and better understanding uh, the materials and devices can be used to identify these noise sources and kind of suppress them at the source. But I think there's a general consensus in the field that that's never going to be enough, you know, partly because in order to do something interesting, you have to open up the system at least somewhat so you can control it. And in the process, you, you expose it to environmental effects. And so in tandem with doing, um, uh, with uh, implementing improvements in materials and devices, we need to come up with smart control schemes to, to suppress these effects further. And this is the topic of today's talk. So how can we take information about the noise uh, to design robust quantum control schemes that implement operations while suppressing the noise at the same time? So this is a, an old idea actually, and you know, at a really high level, if you're not familiar with dynamical decoupling, you can think about this uh, in terms of a, a simple classical analogy of noise canceling headphones, where here the, this is a device that takes in information about the surrounding noise and creates the signal of its own to cancel that effect. So in the context, so just to make things a little bit more concrete, I'll give an example of spin qubits, what the, you know, what the system is and what the main sources of noise are that we are interested in trying to suppress. So spin qubits come in a number of varieties as, as most of you know. So you can have uh, spins localized on donors and semiconductors like silicon. Um, you can use the spin of a molecule as your qubit or you can 
create uh, quantum dots, either self-assembled dots or gate-defined quantum dots in silicon or gallium arsenide and use the spin of a single electron or, or two or three electrons, depending on what you want to do exactly to, to define a qubit. And spin is nice because it provides a natural two-level system if it's a single electron at least. And it's relatively insensitive to noise compared to charge degrees of freedom, which means that it has longer coherence times compared to other degrees of freedom you can use. So here's kind of a snapshot of where things are with gate-defined quantum dots. So people have gone up to a nine qubit device in recent experiments from Jason Pettis group at Princeton, where they demonstrated a uh, nice coherent control of all nine dots where, and they successfully shuttled a single electron from dot number one all the way down to dot number nine and back again. And for smaller systems, they've demonstrated up to four or five electron control simultaneously. So the idea is you would trap one electron in each dot, which is defined by a collection of gate electrodes on the surface of the semiconductor. And then you use you split the energy levels using a constant magnetic field, and you can rotate the spins using either time-dependent magnetic fields or electric fields if you also take into account spin orbit effects. And you can, one way to, to generate um, two qubit coupling is to use exchange interactions between nearest neighbors. And these in turn can be controlled by tuning gate voltages since they're just, um, since they depend on the overlap of the electronic wave functions in the neighboring dots. So the noise in these systems looks as follows. So let's take the case of gallium arsenide quantum dots for concreteness. So here each electron sees the bath of up to about a million nuclear spins um, in the surrounding semiconductor. Every ion in gallium arsenide has a spin full nucleus. And so the Hamiltonian can be expressed in terms of Zeeman energies for each of two electrons and a doubled quantum dot. And then there's a, an exchange coupling that's of Heisenberg form. And charge noise in the system, you know, charges moving around somewhere in the vicinity of the double quantum dot will give rise to fluctuations in the exchange coupling, since this depends on the barrier between the two electrons. And so that's sensitive to electric fields. And in addition to charge noise, there's also nuclear spin noise, which just comes from the fact that these nuclear spins have you know, evolved, they interact with each other and with the electron, and they create an effective magnetic field that the electron sees, and it's effectively stochastic. It fluctuates slowly over time because of the nuclear spin evolution. And so these two, in gallium arsenide, these two types of noise are kind of comparable to each other in terms of how much decoherence they cause in the electron spins, and both need to be dealt with in order to to make this a viable system for quantum computing or some other application. So for nuclear spin decoherence, uh, the way you can, you can test for the presence of this kind of noise is to prepare the system, prepare the spin along the z-axis, rotate it to the xy plane so that it becomes kind of exposed to noise fluctuations of the external magnetic field in the z direction. And then by just seeing how much the spin precesses and averaging over many runs of the experiments, you can, you can estimate the, the decoherence of this, of this magnetic field fluctuation. And so here's a typical plot that experimentalists see. If you plot the spin projection as a function of time, you get, this, you get these oscillations from the precessing spin, but at the same time, you also see this rapid decay. And if you don't do anything in the system, um, the decay happens on the, on the scale of a few tens of nanoseconds. So this is a plot from Amir Jacobi's group at Harvard from about 10 years ago now. Now, most of us know that we can do some simple tricks to extend the lifetime of the qubit in this case. For example, the simplest thing we could do is a Hahn spin echo, where as the spin is precessing around the equator, if we apply a very fast pi pulse, we flip the spin by 180 degrees. And then if we assume that the noise fluctuation is slow, the spin will just kind of retrace and reverse its initial trajectory and come back to its, to its either its starting point or uh, 180 degrees from the starting point, depending on, exa on exactly which axis you pick for the pi poles. And you recover the, the original uh, pure state. So this is a simple trick that's been widely used in quantum information technologies to extend coherence times uh, to counteract the effects of dephasing, like nuclear spin noise uh, causes in in gallium arsenide quantum dots. Now, of course, you could do more than just a single pi pulse halfway through the evolution. You could also do more complicated delta function pulse sequences. 
And these are more advantageous in the cases where the noise has time dependence, which in any real system, there is some time dependence of the noise. And so if the noise has time dependence by adding more and more delta function pulses at the right times, you can extend the coherence further. And this has been demonstrated in a number of different physical platforms, including uh, gallium quantum dots like we've been talking about. Uh, this is a plot for an electron spin qubit defined, I'm sorry, this is a nuclear spin qubit defined on a phosphorus donor in silicon. And then this is an example from NV centers in diamond. And interestingly, we see in the, in the case of phosphorus donors in silicon, you can extend the coherence times of the nuclear spin up to almost a minute now actually is the, I think the record, which is really amazing if you think about it. But all these um, techniques based on delta function pulse sequences, they, they preserve the, the state of the qubit, but they do not implement uh, operations like we need for quantum computing or, or other applications. And so really what we need to be able to do is to combat noise while we're implementing gate operations. And of course, by a gate operation, all I mean is we apply some time dependent field to the qubit and implement the desired evolution, which at the final time is equal to something like a Hadamard gate or a not gate or whatever gate is of interest for the given application. And so can we design gates in such a way that we implement these operations, but at the same time we cancel noise, just like we do in dynamical decoupling. So if we just think about the simplest case where we have a, a single qubit, that's subject to some time dependent driving field omega of t. And delta here could be uh, either some constant energy splitting or detuning if I'm in the rotating frame of the driving field and so on. Really pretty much any driven qubit can be expressed in, a, in, a, in terms of a Hamiltonian like this. So the question is if omega of t and or delta have some fluctuation caused by the environment, is it possible to choose omega of t in such a way that at least the leading order, the actual evolution operator we get at the final time is equal to the target gate operation that we wanted, while first order and possibly higher orders as well are, are canceled out. So that's the, the main objective of this talk. Now this, this uh, idea has been around for a while also. I mean, shortly after Hans Pineco and CPMG were invented, people from primarily from the nuclear magnetic resonance community thought about doing something similar with square pulses. And so here's um, an example of a square pulse sequence that works for single triplet qubits that myself and some colleagues developed a couple of years ago. So here the, the issue is that although NMR sequences like this have been around since the 1960s, uh, in the case of single triplet qubits where you define a single qubit in terms of two electron spins which have an exchange coupling between them, here, the main knob for controlling the qubit is the exchange splitting. And it turns out that it's almost always positive in a double quantum dot. And so this immediately ruled out a lot of the existing NMR sequences that people had developed in the previous 50 or 60 years, because they always assumed that you can make the pulse positive and negative throughout the evolution. Because they're always thinking about time dependent magnetic fields acting on nuclear spins. And there, it's, so it's pretty easy to make the, the envelope go positive and negative. But in single triplets, that's not the case. So we spent some time coming up with new square pulse sequences that would work for single triplet qubits. But in the end, uh, actually, I actually went and visited Amir Yacobi at Harvard for about a month and tried to work with them to implement sequences like this in their experiment. It sort of worked, but in the end, the, the results were never quite satisfactory because it's primarily the fact that these are square pulses and squares are not um, really feasible for actual experiments. Because if you're operating the system on nanosecond timescales, the fact that you can't produce a real square waveform in the laboratory begins to matter a lot. And you know, the deformations of the pulse shape that actually is uh, implemented on the qubit lead to big errors in the, in the performance. So square pulses are nice mathematically because we can easily solve the Schrodinger equation, but they're, not, they're far from ideal for experiments. So the question then, uh, that I tried to address in follow-up work is, can we do something more general? Can we find smooth pulses that cancel noise while implementing gate operations? So to see how we can answer this question, we can take a closer look at the simplest example that you can think of, which is to take a single qubit 
and have a driving field along the x-axis. And now let's assume that this driving field, we can think about this as an AC driving field, either magnetic field or electric field, depending on the physical system we're talking about. Um, we can think about that field as being resonant with the qubit. So that in the absence of noise, the diagonal entries here would just be zero, reflecting the fact that the detuning is zero. But there's noise present in the system and I'll assume that the noise causes energy level fluctuations. And so there's some noise parameter epsilon here that, that uh, accounts for that effect. So epsilon is a, in some sense a small parameter. I can, I'm going to treat it as stochastic, so I don't know what epsilon is, but I'm going to assume that it's constant throughout the, the duration of a single gate, which is pretty realistic for most of the types of noise that are reflecting solid state qubits. And now the way that you proceed to derive dynamical decoupling, for example, is you can, you can perform a perturbative expansion of the evolution operator generated by this Hamiltonian and powers of this noise parameter epsilon. And then if you look at each of these terms order by order, you find that they all depend on a series of complex functions which are recursively related to each other. Um, so the first function is g uh, zero of t is just equal to one. And then at higher orders, you build up the, the rest of them by performing this integral, which depends on the driving field inside this exponent in the integrand. And so if you want to cancel noise, it is tantamount to saying that each of these complex functions has to vanish at the final time, pulse time. And if you want to cancel noise to first order, we just need g1 of t to be zero. If you want to cancel noise to second order, we need g2 of t to also vanish and so on. And so actually, if you want to derive Han spin echo or CPMG or any other pulse sequence that's been known for since the 50s, um, you, can, you would get those solutions by solving these constraints. So then the question is, can we find non-delta functions or pulses which are not square, something smoother that also satisfies these constraints? And we found a, a couple of years ago that a kind of a key that allows us to um, unlock all of those solutions is to interpret these constraints geometrically. And the idea is we take the first order coefficient g1 of t and just plot it in the complex plane So it's a complex function. So as time progresses, it traces out some curve in the complex plane spanned by the real and imaginary parts of G1. And so that's kind of a trivial statement. But what's interesting is that if we take this curve and compute its curvature at some point, it turns out that that is given by the driving field omega. So here by curvature, what I mean is draw a circle that has the same amount of bend as the curve at that particular point. The curvature is the inverse radius of that circle. So this connection between driving field and curvature of the curve is something I find very non-trivial. And I don't have an intuitive way to explain why it has to be, um, but it works out mathematically. And it's a very powerful statement because it means that if I want to, I can describe the evolution of the system by drawing this curve G1, and I can immediately read off the driving field that implements that, that particular particular evolution by looking at the curvature. And there's some simple formula for the, for, for the curvature from differential geometry. Now, in addition to that statement, it also turns out that the evolution time is equal to the arc length along the curve. So at every point along the curve, if I stop here and say how much time has elapsed, all I need to do is just measure the length along the curve up to that point. Now, the reason why this is a, a very useful observation is because what I'm drawing is, is this first order coefficient, G1. And I said that in order to cancel first order noise, I need to make sure that G1 at the final time is equal to zero. But from the point of view of this curve, what that means is that the curve has to come back to the origin. So then if I draw a closed curve like this, I'm guaranteed that the noise will be canceled to first order. And then if I want to know which pulse achieves that, all I need to do is to compute the curvature of this curve at every point. And so here's a, a nice uh, simple example of a closed curve. And by extracting the curvature at each point, I get the pulse envelope, which in this case looks something like this. 
Now, one nice way to get nice smooth closed curve like this is to use uh, what are called lemnus gates, which just means a figure eight shape. And back in the 19th century, various famous mathematicians were obsessed with uh, certain lemnus gates. Each mathematician had their favorite set of lemnus gates. And so if you want to create a closed curve like this, you can just take a lemnus gate and chop it in half and you get a nice smooth curve. So this example is called the Girono lemnus gate. Now Bernoulli also had his favorite class of lemnus gates. And so if you use those, you instead get curves that look like this. And if you extract the curvatures of these, you get the corresponding pulse shapes shown on the right side. So these are four different closed curves and they give four different pulses that cancel noise to first order. Now the third uh, important observation about this uh, connection between geometry and, and robust evolution is that the rotation angle you implement on the qubit is given by the opening angle at the origin. Uh, so here I'm assuming that I'm driving the, the qubit resonantly which means that I'm doing X gates on the qubit. And so the opening angle at the origin is basically determining the angle of the X rotation. So then the statement is that, um, so here I've made no assumptions anywhere. So in fact, the, the general statement is that any pulse which cancels noise to first order while implementing an X gate corresponds to a closed curve with the appropriate opening angle at the origin. So this is the general solution to this problem. So in this example down here of Bernoulli lemnus gates, here I have four different curves that have different opening angles at the origin. So these all implement different X gates. But I could also just look for classes of curves that have the same opening angle and every such curve will give me the same target gate operation in the end while canceling noise. So I, in general, I, have, I can see easily, see I have infinitely many solutions for a given target gate. Now, so this is supposed to be general, so I should be able to go back and understand the well-known delta function pulse sequences from the 50s and beyond in this language. And that's pretty straightforward. So if I want to think about spin echo, for example, so spin echo means apply a delta function pulse halfway through the evolution. So in terms of the curve, this, this means we need straight lines because straight lines have zero curvature and zero curvature means no pulse. So we start at the origin and then as time progresses, there's no pulse for the first half of the evolution. So we just go straight up the line here. But then halfway through the evolution, there's a delta function pulse, which means the curvature is infinite. And it's a pi pulse. So that means we, we turn around by a full um, 180 degrees. And then for the second half of the evolution, again, there's no pulse. So we just retrace the same line and stop it when we get back to the origin, which guarantees that there's no noise to first order. And so this straight line here will, of course, give us this delta function pulse. And this is how we understand spin echo geometrically. Now, any other delta function pulse sequence can be understood in very much the same fashion. So for example, CPMG means start at the origin, you know, initially trace the straight line because there's no pulse. And then when the pulse, is, uh, when the pulse is applied, we turn around 180 degrees and then come back down. But for CPMG, the, the delay between the first and second pulse is twice as long as the de delay from the initial time to the first pulse. So that means we overshoot the origin when we come back down and we don't turn around until we reach the, this antipodal point down here. And then we just keep going up and down along this line until we're ready to stop, in which case we stop halfway. So that gives exactly the CPMG sequence. And of course you can easily see from the geometry side that the first order noise is canceled. So this, uh, idea of drawing closed curves on a plane is just generalizing this um, this idea. It's showing that the full solution space to this problem is obtained by drawing two-dimensional curves rather than just drawing uh, lines that go back and forth and overlap multiple times. So that's first order noise cancellation. What about higher order noise cancellation? So what we found is that if you look at the second order coefficient G2 of T, at the final time, this is proportional to the area enclosed by the curve. Again, I don't have a, a nice way to, to make that intuitive to you, but the math works out very nicely. So what this means is that I need to draw 
closed curves that also have zero net area enclosed in them. And this is achieved by drawing curves that have that reverse their orientation uh, at some point along the evolution. So for example, if I look at this blue figure eight curve here, I, I started at the origin. Now let's suppose that in the upper half, I trace this curve counterclockwise. And so then in the lower half, I'm going to trace it clockwise. So the fact that the upper half is counterclockwise and the lower half is clockwise means that there's a relative sign between the, the orientations of these two areas. And so the net area enclosed by the blue curve is zero. So this blue curve will cancel second order noise in addition to first order noise. And of course, any other figure eight like this will, will achieve the same thing. So these are um, all, these are four different examples of closed curves that have zero net area. And so they all give me robust pulses to second order. Now it's still true here that the, that the gate operation that's implemented depends on the opening angle at the origin. But for all these perfect figure eight shapes, that opening angle is just pi. And so all of these examples in this first panel here give me the same target operation, which is, uh, it turns out to be an identity operation. To get non-trivial X rotations while canceling noise to second order, I need to draw something that's a bit less symmetric. So for example, I could draw this orange curve here, which again is kind of like a figure eight, but now it's been deformed. And it's still the fact that it has the self-crossing means that the two lobes of this curve are gonna have opposite orientations and they'll cancel each other if I, if I draw the curve in just such a way that this area is the same as that area up to the minus sign. So these are four examples of, of curves that will yield pulses that are robust to second order. Um, and they all implement different X gates because they have different opening angles at the origin now, as you can see here. So to see the advantage of using smooth pulses versus delta functions or square pulses, we need to take into consideration real experimental limitations on pulse generation. So if you try to implement a, a delta function pulse, for example, in a real experiment, especially if it's like spinning qubits and quantum dots or superconducting qubits, you're subject to finite rise times for the pulse. So that means that the delta function actually looks something like this. There's some finite slope and some finite amplitude, obviously. And so if you can achieve the same uh, operation and the same noise cancellation power using a much smoother pulse like this green one, then you get much better performance in terms of fidelities because um, you're no longer subject to these non-idealities that come from the fact that the pulse generators are, are limited. And the same thing goes for square pulses. So if you compare a square pulse versus a smooth pulse that has the same um, bandwidth constraints, you get much better performance for the smooth pulse, as you can see from the plots again of the fidelity versus noise strength. So the real benefit of using smooth, of smooth pulses comes in when you take into account uh, realistic constraints on pulse generators. Now, a big advantage of this geometric approach is that you can visualize everything uh, in terms of curves on a plane. And moreover, that means you could also try to design uh, new pulse shapes just by drawing curves. And so this, you know, it's kind of intuitive that you'd want to create a program that allows you to do this. And a postdoc in our group did that. And so he, he made it so that you could, you know, draw a curve, a closed curve like this uh, using a mouse. And then in real time, it shows you that the pulse you're creating along with how well you're doing in terms of noise cancellation and also in terms of the gate operation that you're trying to achieve. Of course, one difficulty with this is if you're not, you know, unless you're very good at making software, it's, it's a bit challenging to make it not so sensitive to your, your hand shaking. So you have to have a real steady hand to get a nice smooth pulse out of this. But you know, there's a lot of room for improvement here, which hopefully will, will happen at some point. Now, I wanna come back to this uh, second point I made when I first introduced this geometric interpretation, which is that the evolution time is equal to the arc length of the curve. This also is a powerful statement because it means that I can systematically look for the fastest possible pulses that implement some target operation while canceling noise. And I could do that very easily just by trying to find the shortest curves that satisfy um, you know, the constraint on the opening angle at the origin and so on. Now, 
you know, one very simple thing I could do is I could just take a given curve and just shrink it. And if I shrink the curve, then obviously I'm speeding up the, the gate because you know, the, the length of the curve will be smaller. But that's not quite satisfactory because shrinking the curve means I'm increasing the pulse amplitude because uh, when I shrink the curve, I'm increasing the curvature. So in order to make sense of this problem, I need to impose pulse constraints. So for example, if I impose a constraint on the pulse amplitude, geometrically, this becomes a constraint on the curvature of the curve I draw. So if I want to respect the pulse amplitude constraint, I have to draw a curve that does not have a curvature that exceeds some amount at any point. And now given a constraint like this, now I can ask, what is the fastest possible pulse that implements the target gate while canceling noise and respecting the pulse constraint? And this, um, the geometric way of thinking about things begs for a variational calculus solution. Because what I want to do is I want to minimize the length of the curve while respecting the constraint on the curvature, which I can do using slack variables. So it's really straightforward to write down the, the functional that needs to be minimized. This is the length of the curve, the first term. And the second term is imposing the constraint uh, on the curvature that it not exceed some amount. And here we can just make the upper bound one um, in full generality, just to pick our unit to be the amplitude of the pulse. So the, the resulting Euler-Lagrange equations turn out to be incredibly simple and the solution is that the curves, the optimal curves have to be made up of straight lines and circular arcs of radius one. So the radius is determined by the, the maximal pulse amplitude I'm allowed. So then the task becomes, how can I make closed curves out of these two basic components, straight lines and circular arcs? So there are three ways we can think of to make closed curves using only three segments, which, which will correspond to the, the shortest possible curves. And then for each of these three cases, so the first one has two straight lines and one circular arc. The second example has one straight line and two circular arcs. And the third one has three circular arcs. So you can take all three cases and just compute the lengths of the curves as a function of the target rotation angle and the qubit. And it turns out that the, the curve comprised of three circular arcs always wins in terms of gate speed. So then this is the globally optimal solution to the problem. Now, of course, if it's a curve made of three circular arcs, well, a circle is a curve of constant curvature. So that means that the corresponding pulse is gonna be made up of square pulses. And so we see that here, initially the curvature is negative. So the square pulse starts off at minus one and then it comes up to one and then it comes back down to minus one for the final segment. So the optimal solution is a square pulse sequence. But of course, I spent some time motivating the need to look for smooth pulses. Um, so we'll come back in a second to understanding how we can turn this into a smooth pulse solution, which is at least very close to optimal in terms of gate speed. You could do the same procedure for second order noise cancellation. So you can again, set up the variational calculus problem, put a constraint on the curvature of the curve to respect the pulse amplitude constraint. And now you also put a constraint that the area of the curve has to vanish, which you just do with a Lagrange multiplier. Again, the solution is, is of the Euler-Lagrange equations is very simple. You again have to look at straight lines and circular arcs. We again find that the optimal solution, globally optimal solution is made up purely of circular arcs. And in particular, in this case, we have five such circular arcs. There's one piece here, another piece there, and so on. So again, at second order, the optimal pulse is a square, is a composite square pulse with five segments as shown here. And you can systematically find exactly what each of these time durations should be in each segment given some target rotation angle. But now to make the pulse waveform more experimentally friendly, we can convert these pulses into smooth pulses. And there are two ways you can think about doing this. One way is you could take the square and just, just to apply some smoothening procedure. Uh, there are various ways you could do that, some cubic spline interpolation or something. Uh, or you can go back to the curve itself and somehow deform that such that the pulse that results from it uh, is smooth. And now it turns out that the second way is preferable in general because 
if you work with the curve itself and try to smooth in that in some sense, then it's much easier to maintain the noise cancellation constraints. You know, the, the fact that the curve has to come back to the origin and it has to have zero area enclosed. Whereas if you try to just take the square waveform and smooth in that, you end up violating to some degree these constraints. And so if you impose um, various rise time or bandwidth constraints on the pulse waveforms and do a comparison between these two approaches to smoothening, you find that the that smoothing the curve always wins. And moreover, you can you can find a smoother version of the pulse with very minimal sacrifice in gate speed. So all of this discussion so far has been focused on the case of resonant driving or the detuning between the pulse and the target transition frequency of the qubit is zero. Now I want to consider the case of non-resonant driving. So now here we include a non-zero detuning delta in the Hamiltonian. And so epsilon will be some small fluctuation away from this, uh, this value delta. So one immediately one immediate difficulty in this case now is that we can no longer do a perturbation theory expansion like we did before to derive these noise cancellation constraints. And in fact, this is you know it's a long-standing problem that it's not possible to analytically solve the Schrodinger equation even for a two-level system in the case of tie independence, at least for a non-zero detuning. So in order to make progress in this non-resonant driving case, we need to somehow get around this this uh, difficulty with solving the Schrodinger equation. And if you look at the history of, of this problem dating back to the early 1930s, there really is a small handful of solutions to the Schrodinger equation for a two-level time-dependent problem. There, of course, you can solve it for the square pulse, which is motivated, which is what motivated all those early NMR pulse sequences. You can solve it in the case of linear driving, which is the famous landau uh, zener problem of driving to an avoided crossing. There's also this interesting case uh, discovered by Rosen and Zener, where if you choose the pulse envelope to be a hyperbolic secant function, then the Schrodinger equation written as a second order differential equation looks like the hypergeometric equation. And so you can derive properties of the evolution uh, based on that. But since the early 1930s, there have just been a, a handful of other examples of analytical solutions to the two level Schrodinger equation, usually based on special functions like Hoyne functions or elliptic functions. And these, this collection of analytical results is far too limited for what we want to do. So the reason why it's so limited is because basically what people would do is they would just write down the second order Schrodinger equation for an unspecified driving field. And then they try to choose the driving field such that this differential equation becomes some famous differential equation that was studied by 19th century mathematicians, which then allows you to write down properties of the evolution. So we came up a few years back, we came up with a way to do this more systematically via a certain partial reverse engineering technique. And the basic idea is to think about this equation not as an equation for the evolution operator, but instead as an equation for the driving field. So the idea is pretty simple. You can just pick whatever evolution you want and then try to, and then you can read off the driving field that gives you that evolution by using the fact that it, when you view this equation as, a, as an equation for omega, even though it's nonlinear, you can still write down the, the exact solution in general. So then the idea is you can plug in whatever evolution you want into this formula and read off the driving field that gives it to you. Uh, with the caveat that you have to make sure that the right-hand side here is real in order to respect the, hermit the hermeticity of the Hamiltonian, which is a little bit tricky to do, but it, uh, we showed a general way that you can do it. So we use this to generate all kinds of new examples of analytically solvable two-level systems. Um, you can basically get any sort of rough pulse shape that you want. And this idea is really relying on the fact that usually in quantum information applications, we don't care about solving the Hamiltonian or the Schrodinger equation for a particular pulse shape. Instead, we want to just input some basic um, constraints on the pulse shape, or maybe some basic information like, do we want a bell-shaped curve? Do we want something that oscillates periodically or something else? And it's easy to find solutions that obey these general uh, types of criteria. Whereas if you ask me, what is the solution for a Gaussian of a given width, uh, that's something you can't solve analytically. So we, we borrow this philosophy to generalize our geometric formalism to the non-resonant driving case. And so 
the idea here is that we start starting from a Hamiltonian like this, where we have driving along, say, two axes, x and y. And then there's an error term along the z axis. We can systematically map this Hamiltonian, the evolution of this Hamiltonian, to a curve. But now it's a curve in three dimensions instead of two dimensions. So a curve in three dimensions is characterized by two numbers. So it has a curvature like a plane curve, like we talked about. But now it has a second function that varies along the curve, which is called the torsion. And the torsion is a measure of how much the curve is bending out of a, of a plane at every point along the curve. And that plane is made up, is spanned by the tangent vector of the curve at that point and the curvature vector. So interestingly, it's still true that the curvature is given by the pulse envelope in the Hamiltonian. And now the torsion is equal to the detuning. So here, if I think about, if I take the case where phi is a constant times t, a linear function of time, that constant is just the detuning. So there's a very nice mapping between three-dimensional curves and single qubit Hamiltonians. And now the, the way that noise cancellation works turns out to be very similar to what we had in the case of resonant driving. So it's still true that if we want the noise to cancel to first order, that means that we need the three-dimensional curve to be closed. And so here's an example of that. And we can extract the, the pulse envelope from the curvature of this. And, and in this example, we have driving both along the x direction and the y direction. So both quadratures are, are plotted here. And you, you can, of course, compute the fidelity as a function of noise strength to confirm that noise really is being canceled by these pulses. And now the constraint for second order noise cancellation generalizes to the statement that now instead of the area of a single curve having to vanish, what happens is that we take our three-dimensional closed curve and look at the shadows along three orthogonal directions. And now each of these shadows must have zero vanishing area inside. And this is an example of that. You can kind of see that the shadow will have zero area in this case, in that case, it's a little hard to see there, but it does work out. And so now if you extract the curvature of this curve um, and the torsion, you can find the pulses that correspond to this curve. So, so we can think about this procedure as being a way to derive new pulses given some pulse constraints and some target evolution operator. But we can also turn it around and think of this as a diagnostic tool to implement, to kind of um, analyze the performance of pulses obtained some other way. So we did this um, in a joint work with Andrew Zurek's group from the University of New South Wales, where they work on quantum dot spin qubits in silicon. And there they had recently designed some single qubit gates using the GRAPE algorithm, which is a numerical recipe for generating um, usually smooth pulse shapes that implement various target operations. And so what we did is we took their, their pulses that were numerically generated for, in this case, four different types of gates, identity, an X gate, a Z gate, and a Hadamard gate. And we turned them into curves. Since the, cur since the pulse is just giving us the curvature, we can generate the curves from that information. And then we, and then we can use the curves to analyze to what degree these pulses are actually canceling the noise. And in addition, we can kind of see which part of the noise is not being canceled completely. So for each of these examples, we can see that the curve looks to be essentially closed in all cases. So in every case, GRAPE is doing a good job of canceling first order noise. But now if you look at some of the shadows here, we can see in a lot of the cases, the shadows have zero enclosed area. But there are a few cases where that doesn't quite work out. For example, here, this particular component of the second order noise was not canceled. So this kind of illustrates the idea that we can use this geometrical formalism not only as a way to design new pulses, but also to analyze existing pulses or pulses obtained a different way, for example, from numerical algorithms. And in addition, we can identify exactly which part of the noise is not being canceled, and we can try to update the pulse to correct for that. So for example, at this point, we can then try to modify the curve a little bit to, to make this area cancellation constraint work out. 
in addition to the ones that already did work. So this is a nice way to generate a feedback between numerical recipes and this geometric approach. So in the last few minutes, I wanna say a bit about our recent work to generalize these ideas to multi-level and multi-qubit systems. Uh, we find that it basically translates um, pretty nicely to larger systems, to systems of arbitrary sized Hilbert spaces. And the key to understanding how this generalization works is to think about what are called Frenet's array frames. So the idea behind a Frenet's array frame is kind of illustrated in this cartoon here, is that as the curve evolves, there's a set of, in the case of a three-dimensional vector, uh, of a three-dimensional curve, there's a set of three vectors, unit vectors, that are all orthogonal to each other, but they their orientation varies along the curve. And so these define a sort of local frame at each point along the curve. And one of these vectors, the orange one in this cartoon, is the tangent vector to the curve. So it points in the direction in which the curve is moving at that, at that point. Um, the, the green curve, uh, the green arrow here is pointing in the direction of the curvature. So it's pointing in the direction in which the curve is bending the most. And then the, the blue arrow is the direction associated with the torsion. So it's just orthogonal to the tangent and the curvature vector. And you can see in the, on the plot on the right here, this is tracing out what the torsion and the curvature look like as, as you move along the curve. And so from our three-dimensional geometric pulse shaping point of view, this is, these are the, the pulse and the detuning uh, that come out of this curve. But now there's a set of equations that Frenet and Surrey wrote down quite some time ago, which is an equation for these unit vectors. And it's expressed, so it basically says that the time derivative of each unit vector depends on the next unit vector in the sequence and also the previous one. And there are coefficients here which are called generalized curvatures. So for example, if we had a three-dimensional curve and we look at the derivative of the tangent vector, this would define for us the usual curvature that we talked about in the case of a plane curve. And there would be the second term here would not be present. And then if we look at the derivative of the curvature vector, that depends on a new, a second curvature, which is what we call the torsion. And it also uh, involves the previous curvature that we, that we define, which is just a regular curvature in the case of three dimensional curves. But for now a curve in any dimension, we have the same set of equations that we can talk about and we have a generalized set of curvatures. And the number of generalized curvatures is one less than the dimension of the space in which the curve lives. So the key to figuring out how we can generalize this geometric formulas into arbitrary sized Hamiltonians is to connect the Hamiltonian to this Frenet's array equation somehow. So here's a, a kind of a overview of how the, how the analysis works. I'm not gonna get into the details. But the, the basic idea is you start with a general Hamiltonian H, which you divide in terms of a part that has no errors in it, H zero. And then, there, let's, and then there's one error term, which has some small parameter epsilon, which guarantees that this is small in some sense. And Q is some operator acting in the error space. So now kind of following along with what we did in the two dimensional and three dimensional cases, we can define a set of Frenet's array basis vectors which um, involve this error term, and they also involve the evolution of the unperturbed Hamiltonian H0. So for example, in the case of the tangent vector, this operator A is just the identity, and the tangent vector is defined by R dagger QR. So it's defined to be basically this error term in the interaction picture, defined with respect to this unperturbed Hamiltonian. But now if we generalize this and include here some unknown op operator a n for, for a moment, then we can take this expression for these vectors and then we can differentiate them and we end up with two terms. And so then the idea is, can we find a set of these operators a n such that these, this set of equations here resembles the Frenet's array equations? Can we somehow identify each of these two terms as being proportional to these other two basis vectors above and below this differentiated vector in the sequence of Frenet's array basis vectors? And can we also read off the coefficients to extract the generalized curvatures in terms of the Hamiltonian? So 
So the answer is yes, I won't bore you with all the mathematical details, but it turns out that these operators a n, um, if you choose them according to this recursion formula here, starting from the first a1 being one, being the identity operator, then you can systematically generate all the other a's such that you end up with exactly the Fernet Suri equations expressed now in terms of your unperturbed Hamiltonian. And so then you can read off, given some Hamiltonian, you can read off the generalized curvatures associated with that Hamiltonian. So this is the generalization of the idea that the, the pulse envelope is the curvature in the case of a plane curve or a three-dimensional curve. So then using this insight about how to connect general Hamiltonian to generalized curvatures, we went ahead and did some examples. So here's an example of designing a robust gate in a two transmon qubit system. So if you have two superconducting transmons and you work uh, deep within the dispersive regime, you can express the Hamiltonian like this um, and ignoring the higher levels of the transmon. So basically the interaction between the two qubits is of, of ZZ type. This is a kind of well-known ZZ coupling that arises in these systems. And we'll assume that we're driving just one of the qubits, the second qubit in this case. So, and of course we also have energy splittings. And so if you write out this Hamiltonian as a four by four matrix, you have this block-like structure here. And the fact that E1 and E2 are distinct from each other is a reflection of the fact that we have this ZZ coupling, that the two qubits are coupled to each other, which creates this um, splitting between the two frequencies of these subspaces. And we'll assume that we have dephasing noise coming, for example, from magnetic field fluctuations, which uh, mess up the frequencies of the qubits if these are flux tunable qubits. And so the, our noise term in the Hamiltonian is um, some stochastic parameter epsilon times Z2. So given this Hamiltonian and this um, noise term in the Hamiltonian, we can use the formulas from the previous slide to compute the curvatures. In this case, we end up computing five distinct curvatures. And so the evolution of this two qubit system maps onto a curve in six dimensions. So then the idea is, can we, find, can we draw a curve in six dimensions and then read off the driving fields that will combat this noise uh, from the curvatures of that curve? Now, this is a tricky problem because if I look at these generalized curvatures, I see that they all depend on basically three quantities. They depend on the driving field of mega and also on the energy Z1 and E2. So that means that these five functions are, are all interdependent. They all depend on, really on only one function of time. So I can't just draw any six dimensional curve. I have to draw six dimensional curves that have very strong constraints such that these curvatures obey the, this, uh, this set of relations here. So this looks like a really hard problem, but I have a trick I can use, which is to notice that my Hamiltonian has this block diagonal structure, which allows me to think about each of these two blocks as being like a single qubit. So I can actually think about this qubit separately. It's not really a qubit, it's just a two-level two -level subspace. Um, but I can think about this like a qubit, and I can think about the evolution from this block in terms of a three-dimensional vector like we talked about earlier. So I can actually decompose the six-dimensional curve into two three-dimensional curves. So the problem is not nearly as complicated as it initially seems. So then the task becomes, how can I draw two closed three-dimensional curves um, while respecting the constraints on the previous slide? And I see, if I look at this, one way I can simplify the problem is to assume that omega is piecewise constant, which means I have the square um, pulse sequence. In that case, each curvature is constant for each segment of the curve. And so in terms of three-dimensional curves, this means that the curvature and the torsion of those three-dimensional curves are constant along each segment. Now, a, a three-dimensional curve of constant curvature and constant torsion is a helix, which is kind of intuitive because if the curvature is constant, it means you're basically trying to form a circle, which is a curve of constant curvature. But the torsion is also constant, which means that the rate at which you exit the plane at every point defined by the curvature and the tangent vector is constant. So you're constantly rising out of the plane in which the circle lives. So that gives you a helix. 
So square pulses with constant detuning are generally described in terms of helices. So what I need to do is to form a closed curve out of helices. And so the fewest number of helices I can use to do that is three. So by taking three helices and connecting them together, I can generate a square pulse sequence that will cancel the noise to leading order for this two transmon problem. But again, I really in, am interested in computing smooth pulses. So what I can do is I can start from this closed curve based on three helices that are connected to each other. And I can try to replace each helix with a deformed helix so that the resulting pulse is smooth. But I need to do this in such a way that the torsion remains constant. And so we found that using um, some numerics, we could we can define an ansatz for each uh, each part of this three-part curve with some tunable parameters, and you can adjust those parameters so that you're guaranteed that the detuning is constant, the torsion is constant, but the pulse shape becomes smooth. So we basically deformed each of these two closed curves here to get smooth curves uh, that don't have constant curvature at every point. And then this translates into a nice smooth pulse. And you can see that this pulse has three equal parts just coming from the fact that we designed a closed curve based on three equal curves. And then to confirm that the resulting pulse actually works, we plot the fidelity as a function of the noise strength. This is logarithmic. And the result is the blue curve here. And then if you want to verify that you've indeed canceled the first order noise, what you could do is just make a, just sketch on the same graph what the first order noise would look like and what the second order noise would look like. And then by comparing the slopes, you can see that indeed the fidelity that we find from our design pulse is, um, has the same behavior as second order. So it's consistent with having canceled the first order noise. Okay, so that's the, I'm at the end of my talk. So just to summarize, so I've shown you, I've shown you this nice uh, connection between robust gates and closed geometric curves. Uh, and this allows us to design nice, smooth, experimentally friendly pulses that will cancel various types of noise for a given physical system while implement, implementing target operations. And a particular advantage of this approach is it gives us a, a global view of the optimal control space. So usually if you use methods like GRAPE or, or other numerical methods, you always have this issue that um, you, you end up getting locally optimal solutions and you, you never really get a view of the global landscape of possible pulses. And so going forward, we're interested in trying to combine these two approaches. Can we use the fact that this geometric approach gives us a global view of the solution space and then combine it with numerical recipes like GRAPE to kind of more efficiently generate pulses that satisfy the various constraints. And then we're also interested in generalizing these ideas to time-dependent noise to take into account the fact that the noise fluctuation can vary during the duration of the gate. We've already um, produced some results on this where we find that basically, again, you need to find closed curves, but now um, you need curves that kind of wiggle at the, at the frequencies uh, associated with the noise power spectrum. And then another important question is, can we do something similar when we have a qubit that's subject to multiple noise sources at once? Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop here and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. And Thanks a lot for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm just going to reiterate what I said at the beginning. If, if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, just hover with your pointer over the screen. Uh, at the bottom, you will see a little button saying Q&A. Press that button and then just write into the field, hey, I, I want to ask a question. And then we'll promote you to a panelist so you can come live and ask the question. Um, I think maybe whilst people are doing that, I just had like one fairly technical question and I apologize if, if you kind of mentioned it, but, and I missed it. But in, in the kind of beginning, first half of your talk, you mentioned that, and you then came back to it, but you mentioned that the length of, of these curves is directly proportional to, to the time of these pulses, right? That's right, yeah. Why is that? Uh, or am I missing something fundamental or? Um, so 
I can give you a mathematical answer. Physically, why it had to be the case, I, I don't know. But mathematically, you, the way you can think about it is that the the curve I'm drawing is basically the Hamiltonian in the interaction picture, where you know I start with a Hamiltonian that has the unperturbed part and then the error term, and I go to the frame where I, defined by the unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian. And now, if the if the perturbation Hamiltonian uh, squares to unity, like if it's a if it's a Pauli operator, for example, then that means that the the tangent vector I define from that interaction frame Hamiltonian will have unit length, because if I take the tangent vector will basically be like R dagger error operator R, and if I take the, the trace, if I square that and take the trace, that's basically just the the trace of the error operator squared. And so if that's the identity, this turns out to be one if I normalize the, that term correctly. Now, the fact that the, the tangent vector is unity at all points along the curve is the same thing as saying that time is the arc length parameterization of the curve. Cool. So you can think about it as being sort of built into the way I define the curve in the first place. That because I, I define it to be in this interaction frame and I'm defining the error term to be such that if I square it, I get the identity matrix. That sort of guarantees that this arc length parameterization being time is going to work out. It seemed there seemed to be a lot of like kind of nice mathematical things that just worked out throughout this entire work. Yeah, there's definitely more to be understood about why, why all this works out. Uh, yeah. I don't have a, a good understanding of that yet. Cool. Um, we have a, a question from from Dr. Thierry Ferris. Uh, Thierry, are you on the pa did I are you on the panel now? Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, thanks, uh, Ed, for the nice talk. Um, actually, I will place myself on the uh, more uh, experimental and practical side of it. So um, I'm still asking questions. So the way I understand um, your talk is typically um, roughly uh, in order to be able to cancel the noise as as good i mean the best you can uh, you have typically go for smoother uh, pulses but i will uh, expect that smoother pulses is um, more adiabatic so the question is what is the limit there because if it's totally adiabatic then uh, uh, this will pose uh, problems for in terms of entanglement uh, so what's the um, What's the limitations there? Yeah, so the so the constraints for canceling noise are really just that you need the curve to close on itself. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go to higher order cancellation, you also need this zero area constraint to be satisfied. Um, given that, you know, the question becomes what is the best pulse, what is what is the best class of pulses that achieve these things while respecting ex pulse generation constraints? And the two basic constraints that my experimental collaborators always tell me about are pulse amplitude and pulse bandwidth. And the amplitude is, is very easy to understand geometrically because that just means I can't draw a curve that curves too much. I can't bend too much at any point. Mm -hmm. In terms of the bandwidth, that's kind of a, a statement about how the curve changes to the next highest order. Like how quickly is that, is that bending happening? It's the third order, it's the third derivative of the curve. Yeah. I mean, the, the the other question I had um, is a is a bit of a, is a bit of a follow up on that. So I mean, you talk about the multi qubit thing, which is obviously something where everybody has to go uh, to. Uh, but obviously, as you mentioned, it um, more qubits, so you will have uh, other extra sources of noise. It's not individual qubits. Then you have uh, also other interaction, maybe other things, um, sources of noise coming from there. So. Scaling to a large number of qubits, uh, you will have um, more difficulty in canceling the noise, which uh, in turn will require far more complex pulses. Now, the question is um, if you have more complex or more um, smoother and complex pulses, at some point, the, in order to do, for example, the Z rotation, like you mentioned, um, it would take uh, quite a, a relatively long time. 
And obviously, if you want to have your uh, uh, quantum computer to work, you should still be able to, to have that uh, sufficiently sort so that actually you can make a, a reasonable number of um, operations during that time. So is there a problem there or maybe there is a, a way to go around that? I don't know. Well, I, I would say it's more like an opportunity because you know, I think these, these kinds of issues that you're mentioning, you know, people have been running up against them for quite a while. And I think part of the difficulty with getting around them is that it's, people don't really know what's, you know, what, what is the fundamental, fundamental limit if you're trying to implement, say, a CNOT gate in some system. You can try to keep speeding up the gate and eventually it stops working you know, for one or another reason. But, we're, but really where the limit is and whether it's something you can, you can somehow modify yourself by doing something to the system or the control scheme is largely unknown. So I think the way I think about it is that when you go to multi-qubit systems, you definitely need to use numerical recipes to get a handle on the pulse design and, and so on. But I think this geometric approach kind of allows us to modify or to supplement that with a global understanding of what's going on. So can we see, well, I can see that in order to create a CNOT gate in this three qubit system, I need to be able to have a curve that does this particular thing. And I know that this is the shortest curve that will do it. So that gives me the quantum speed limit for that operation. Okay. Well, and so then I can try to then tailor my numerical recipes around that. I know okay, I, I could start from some analytically designed pulse and then perturb around it numerically to find something that's more optimal for, that takes into account all the aspects of the device, or at least as many of them as I can. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think about this as a complementary tool to existing methods that are numerical. Okay. Thank you. And this, this quantum speed limit issue has been really challenging. I mean, people have, there are lots of papers on quantum speed limits in the abstract, but given some particular, say, three qubit device, what is the limit, the time limit for a, a CNOC? Nobody has a good answer to that. I have a, a follow up to Terry's first question, actually, related to uh, adiabatic uh, processes. So, when you mentioned that you're optimizing a pulse given uh, pulse constraints, so you mentioned these pulse constraints are the amplitude that you can generate and the max bandwidth that you can have. Th these seem to be limitations on the pulse generation and not so much on what they do to the qubit. And then if you have very high amplitudes or very high bandwidth, this could also affect the qubit fidelity. Um, do you take this into consideration or do you assume that the devices, the, the wave generators are well below what could uh, tamper with qubit fidelity? So I do worry about this. And I would say that for the pulse bandwidths, usually um, those are dictated by the wave generator the waveform generator. Mm -hmm. For the pulse amplitude, it really is physical constraints that come into play. It's not so much that the you can't generate stronger pulses. It's that if you did, you would mess up your system. Right. And so then this, so this is, for example, as some threshold that you know experimentally, or do you is this something that you so usually it's it's a phenomenological thing that my experimental collaborators tell me. So for example, in the case of these uh, pulses designed for spin qubits in silicon you know, there they tell me, don't give me a pulse that exceeds 20 megahertz, because I know if I drive it stronger than that, I'm going to get either leakage or I'm going to heat up the device and create more noise than I want in different channels. And so I just, I take what they tell me and I run with that. But, you know, why exactly is it 20 megahertz in their system? I don't think they know at a microscopic level what's going on. Okay. We had a question from Alex Lasek. Uh, Alex, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're there. Okay, cool. Um, so basically, me and Hugo were like kind of a similar thing where we're trying to drive a charge qubit and a dot that has the tuning built into it. And I guess we're approaching it in a different way because we're not thinking primarily about the error, but just we're trying to find sequences to do uh, universal rotations given constraints of similar to you, like adiabacity with the pulse bandwidth and sort of a soft limitation on amplitude. So I guess mm -hmm. we'll limit it by a hard value, but it's sort of inherent to our scheme that the amplitude will be within a certain range that we consider is low and all the pulses will be adiabatic. Well, I guess I just understand your talk more. I want to ask you more about 
what you think about what we're doing in comparison to you. So we're combining sort of theory and numerics to mm. like rise time, so like bandwidth into account and find the uh, control pulses by looking at different lamps and amplitudes and we're sort of assuming different profiles like linear rise time or a sinusoidal rise time and we can find solutions that give universal rotation and good fidelity although we haven't explicitly tested them for are, are they canceling the errors to first or second degree so we end up with basically sinusoidal fast pulses of a specific amplitude that switch between being offset to the positive and the negative side. Is this something that rings a bell with relation to what you're working on? Hugo, you can uh, maybe chime in if what I'm saying is unclear. So, so my understanding from discussions with Hugo a while back is that you're doing kind of microscopic modeling of the of a double dot system where you take into account the shape of the dots and everything else, right? Yeah. So it's much more sophisticated than what I'm talking about. Um, yes. I'm not totally clear on how are you, how do you design the pulse shape? Is this, do you, do you prepare some onsets with tunable parameters and then just try to optimize the fidelity? Oh, we start, yeah. we basically started with a square shape and then we said we have a certain rise time. So mm -hmm. I'll do uh, a delta square. Mm -hmm. Therefore, given that we're going to tune the length and amplitude so that it's equivalent. I see. Yeah, so I think this is this is the kind of thing where I think that this would be a nice place to develop like a complementary approach because I think, you know, what I would hope is that maybe the geometrical formalism can provide some insight about what is the optimal starting point. Like if, instead of starting from a square, could you could you provide something smooth, which is, you know, at least from this effective theory that I'm talking about, it's supposedly optimal. And then plug that into the simulations to get a more realistic uh, view of what's going on in the system and how well it actually works. So. So I think that'd be a really nice opportunity for collaboration if you guys are interested. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We're definitely looking at your work. Once we get this first paper out, we were planning to basically so take some hints from your model, work. Model uh, these curves in our numerical solver and see what it looks like. So you mentioned a mm -hmm. lot about these uh, rotations, uh, I guess, Rx rotations. Are the Ry and Rz rotations as simple? as in like you have this one curve that you define to do an R X, an R Y and an R Z rotation. Yeah, so there's just one curve. The difference is that now it's a curve in 3D. Mm -hmm. um, drawing a curve in 3D is as easy as drawing a curve in 2D. Fair enough, yeah. One challenge that arises for real physical systems is that usually you want to think about the case of you're driving a qubit and there's a constant detuning. And if the detuning is constant, that means you need a, a curve in 3D that has constant torsion. Mm -hmm. So that's an additional complication that doesn't arise in the, the resonant driving case. Now, I didn't talk about it, but we did come up with a recipe, a systematic mathematical recipe to generate closed curves with constant torsion. Um, so you can do that systematically also. But uh, aside from that, it really is about as simple as the plane curve story that I talked about. Okay, and then translating that back into pulses, uh, how many pulses? I guess it's hard to count pulses because they become some arbitrary, uh, ever-changing shape. Yeah, I usually just think about it as one pulse with some- Exactly, it, it just becomes- Potentially same. crazy shape, yeah. Yeah. If you really wanna have a, a sequence, then that means that your curve is becoming flat in some places. Right. So that um, the curvature goes to zero, meaning the pulse envelope goes to zero yeah, at yeah. some point. If that doesn't happen, then really it's just one continuous pulse. One arbitrary pulse, yeah. Okay, cool. We have another question from Norman. Uh, Norman, are you on the panel? Uh, let me see, can you can you hear yeah. me? See? Yeah, hey Norman, hello. Um, uh, sorry, that may be a stupid question and I, I'm also sorry I joined late, but uh, so you show this very, in your talk, uh, this, this very nice geometrical curves, which are, 
low dimensional and then then you have very nice um well view on how you're designing the pulses i was wondering if you had a very complicated device with um where you want to kind of control one qubit but it actually once you control this qubit it also affects other qubits so i was wondering how um how the dim dimensionality of your method kind of grows with the qubit space is is that uh, more defined by the numbers of parameters or if you were to eliminate crosstalk in such a complicated device is that something that grows very rapidly with the number of qubits so the so the dimensionality that the curve lives in depends a lot on the form of the hamiltonian right? not okay. just the number of qubits but exactly what what terms appear so if okay. you have a if you if you have a two qubit Hamiltonian, for example, um, I think I calculated that the highest dimension of the curve would be thirteen dimensional. But that means okay. that you have every every possible term two qubit term in your Hamiltonian, which is not typical in real systems. Okay. okay. Um, so and the two qubit the two transmon qubit example I gave there the curve the original curve is in six dimensions because the structure of the Hamiltonian was was quite specific and Moreover, it could be decomposed into two three-dimensional curves. So it became a pretty easy problem to, to visualize at least. So, what, so if you had like a 2D device and you have like a central qubit you want to control and you have kind of um, eight neighboring qubits that you want to like minimize an effect on, uh, is there an easy way to say how, how many dimensions that would be and if your method would still work there? Uh, I, I can't compute it off the top of my head, but if you gave me the Hamiltonian, I could work it out. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then typically, you know, the, these systems, if it's transmons or spin qubits, typically the Hamiltonian will, will divide up into blocks depending on the symmetries of the problem. And so yeah. every time the Hamiltonian has block structure, you can always break it up into smaller pieces, you know, curves living in smaller dimensions. But there is no but, like easy relationship between like number of qubits and the, the dimension of the curve space or number of parameters and dimension of the curve space. Do you, um, I mean, of course, so, constants could be different. But. So if it, so let's see if it, uh, if you're talking about Hamiltonians that have every possible term for an n qubit system, then it's going to grow exponentially in the number of qubits. Okay, so then then at some point, okay. Yeah, so Thank for you. example, if you have a if you have a two qubit system, you can have at most sixteen distinct terms in the Hamiltonian. Um, okay. But you can always remove the diagonal parts of the Hamiltonian through some frame transformation, and that leaves you with thirteen dimensions that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So then that's going to just scale up to you know if you go to three qubits, it's what is it sixty four dimensional or something. Um, nice. But I did want to mention one thing you mentioned earlier, which is, you know, if you want to think about designing a gate that kind of takes care of crosstalk, that's that's essentially what I did in my two transmon example, except I didn't think I used the right words to express that point. So in this example, I had two transmons with this ZZ coupling. And the ZZ coupling is the, the kind of the well-known residual okay. crosstalk term that, that people like IBM, the IBM group have in their systems because they have this always on interaction. And so in this example, I really am actually designing a single qubit gate on the one qubit while eliminating crosstalk and also defacing noise at the same time. Right. <laughs> Not that you mentioned it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so some things like crosstalk, I think, are kind of natural to treat in this formalism. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, this was super, super interesting. Uh, I mean, it's evident that there are many, many aspects of this that I'm, I'm sure many members of the group would would like to collaborate and, and engage with you and your group on. Yeah, so that'd be great. If, 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 the, if this is something you're interested in, I think we should definitely set up so that Hugo and Alex contacts you and, and we get something going because there seems to be great room for 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 doing something nice together here, um, really clear. Yeah, I, cer I certainly don't have the expertise that you guys have in doing microscopic models with time dependence. That's not something, that's something I've done before. So I, I would definitely benefit from such a collaboration. That's great. So yeah, we should do something like that. And yeah, perfect. Um,
I'm teaching in three minutes, so <laughs> okay. Um, I think this is it, but let, let's keep in contact. And, and yeah, thanks again. Uh, great yeah, to thank have you for the, the nice discussions and interesting questions, and I look forward to further discussions.